From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and welcome to Stray Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. We might call this week's episode Strayed Talk because we are honored to have as our guest Portland, Oregon's very own beloved author Cheryl Strayed. It was 11 years ago Strayed's book, the New York Times bestseller Wild, was published. It has sold more than 4 million copies worldwide and has been translated into 40 different languages. The book, later made into an Oscar-nominated movie starring Reese Witherspoon and Laura Dern, chronicles Strayed's harrowing 1,100-mile trek on the Pacific Crest Trail. The book and movie catapulted Strayed into superstardom. And now she has a new project, a series on Hulu, Tiny Beautiful Things, based on Strayed's life and her advice column, Dear Sugar, which she penned anonymously in the years before Wild was published. The series stars Katherine Hahn as Claire, a struggling writer who becomes an advice columnist amid her own life struggles. Here's a clip from the trailer for Tiny Beautiful Things. You're one of the best writers I know. An advice column is easy clicks. Okay, take a look. You should be the one doing this. I'm not giving anybody advice. What would I tell my 22-year-old self? Someday, you'll look back on that one Christmas when your mother gave you a mustard yellow coat. Don't hold it up and say it's too puffy, because your mother will be dead by spring, and that coat will be the last gift she ever gave you. All eight episodes of the limited series are available now on Hulu. And we are pleased to have joining us on Straight Talk, author Cheryl Strayed. Welcome to Straight Talk. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you. I love that I get to take over this show and make it Straight Talk. Straight, instead talk, of Straight talk, I know. It's, it's perfect. You belong on the show. Thank you. It's really an honor to be here. So thank you, Laurel. Well, we want to congratulate you. You're one of our own. You've lived in Northeast Portland for a long time. Yeah. And so you've been very involved in this, not just based on your book, Tiny right. Beautiful Things, but you've been an executive producer a writer how excited are you for this to launch on Friday the 7th I'm so excited yes it's you know it's really it feels like a long time coming when I first began writing the column back in 2010 never would I have dreamed that we'd end up here with a Hulu television show so I'm really excited and you're right I was a writer on the show and also an executive producer so I was deeply involved in the entire process so for people who've read tiny beautiful things and for people who haven't what can they expect to look forward to on the series well, you know, it's really this book, and I should say this is the old school edition, and then they just released a 10 year, 10th anniversary edition. It's oh, a exciting. green cover with okay. a little sugar cube on the front. It has some new columns as well. And what, you know, the challenge of making this kind of book into a TV show is, of course, this is letters. It's letters people wrote to me, the advice I gave. I will say the advice is pretty unorthodox. I tell a lot of stories from my life. In my advice, there's a lot of story in the book, but it doesn't necessarily, it's not an easy translation. So when we went to the work of adapting it, we really had to think outside the box and we crafted essentially a sugar who is a fictional character, who isn't me. She has a lot in common with me, but it was really fun to sort of delve into not so much the letter writer's lives, but the, li the life of this this sugar columnist. And this is sort of a reunion for you with the stars from the movie Wild, Reese Witherspoon and Laura Dern. They right. were executive producers. Tell us a little bit about your friendship and what it was like working together. Yes, so we made wild in Oregon. It was shot here. It was some of it in Portland, some of it near Bend in various parts of the state. I felt so proud as an Oregonian that we got to make this movie here. And, and of course, even though a lot of my, the trail I hiked in the Pacific Crest Trail, a lot of it was in California. We just tricked out Oregon and made it look like California. <laughs> and in the process of making the film, I was very involved with that too. And Reese Witherspoon and Laura Dern and I became like family. We really hatched a beautiful friendship that lasts to this day. And way back then, we said, let's keep working together. When you find people who you love and who are interesting creative collaborators, you want to keep working with them. I think this book, Tiny Beautiful Things, could be a TV show. And that's when the conversation began all those years ago. Now, it took some time. The path was a little windy. But here we are. And they're both executive producers on the show. And of course, it was Reese's company, Hello Sunshine, that optioned the book. Well, a lot of people on the production side are women. Like, almost every episode is directed or written by a woman. Is that intentional? 
All of the episodes are directed by women directors. We have three amazing directors. Um, there were uh, nine of us in the writer's room, and only one person is a man. It, it really is this female-led show. And of course, there are all kinds of wonderful men on the cast and crew who helped us too. But there is something really powerful, I think, about women, especially in Hollywood, where women's stories have been marginalized and shut out for so long, that, that we're front and center on this show. Well, Katherine Hahn is the, is the star who plays Claire, a very complex character. Yes. She's a struggling writer who becomes an advice columnist. So let's take a look at a clip from the show. Dear Sugar, I'm a messed up woman. I've been married twice. I'm dishonest, impulsive, unhappy, jealous, and lonely. And I have no right to give advice to anyone. You mentioned that, that, that um, Catherine Hahn's character, Claire, is a fictional character. I, I've read that she's something like an alternative person to you right. if you hadn't hiked the trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, if that was transformative for you. How would you describe her character? Yes, so Liz Tigelar, the showrunner, and I had long conversations at the outset you know, who would this character be? And I knew that I didn't want it to be me. I don't need to have a reality television show of my marriage and my kids and, and my life. But I also knew that because in the advice I give as Sugar, I draw on my life. I write about my life experiences. I think it is my life experiences that have given me the kind of wisdom that I do share as in my work as Sugar. And so I said, this character has to have some things in common with me in her past, the things that formed her. My mother died young of cancer at 45. Uh, I, am, I was estranged from my father. I had a young marriage that ended in divorce in my 20s. And I grew up in a rural environment, working class and poor. And those four pillars, if you will, were really so formative to me. They've informed the advice I've given. I said, they have to be in this character's past too. So in the show, we see Catherine Hahn, who's brilliant and hilarious and deep and amazing. And she's living a life that isn't mine. And then the younger Claire, the younger Sugar, is played by the, the extraordinary actress, Sarah Pidgeon. And so many of the scenes that she acts are really straight from my life. Well, you talk about the, sort of like flashbacks. The show yeah. is told a lot in flashbacks with Sarah Pigeon, the young Claire, and Merritt Weaver, uh, Claire's mom. So let's take a look at a clip that shows a flashback. Okay. Let's drive to Mexico. Well, that's kind of far. Come on, on spring break. Would you settle for Dairy Queen on Route 4? How about this? We will save up, and then spring break senior year, we'll go somewhere great. Yeah. Yeah, okay, uh, we've got we've got two years to save. Mm -hmm. Where should we go? Tell us a little bit about the use of flashbacks and the effectiveness in the series. Well, one of, like I said, because this character, like me, was so formed by that early loss, that my mother dying young just as I was becoming a woman. In fact, my mother died over the spring break of my senior yeah. year of college. She was also so a college student, so we were both seniors, and she died of cancer instead of graduating. And that really shaped me so profoundly. And one of the things that I've learned through my own grief and through the years I've spent talking to other people about their grief is that it stays with us, okay? It's not that I'm held back by that grief. It's not that I can't let it go. It's that I carry it with me. And it, 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 that, that essential loss became part of who I am essentially. And that's what we were trying to do in this show. We were trying to tell a story about the ways that our experiences are always with us, that the past informs the kinds of advice we can give in the present or the kinds of parents we are, the, the, the kinds of lives we lead. And so through that um, device, of telling this story in different timelines. That's what we were trying to communicate. And there, there's a scene in the series where Claire's mom tells her she's dying, and you mm -hmm. said that's straight out of your own life. Mm -hmm. How tough was that to watch that scene? Well, you know, it was one of the most moving experiences of my life, both in witnessing Wild being made, because I was on the set with Wild, too, and then this past summer, sitting there on the Disney lot in Burbank, watching on the soundstage, watching Sarah Pigeon, Merritt Weaver, 
Owen Painter, who plays the character who's sort of based on my brother, watching them reenact scenes that were indeed from my life. Some of those things they said, those were the things that we said. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt um, an incredible sorrow sometimes, but more than anything, what I felt was overwhelmed with a sense of wonder and gratitude at the ways that the things that, that are the hardest for you at the time can turn into something beautiful over time, something that feels like a gift, not just to me, but a gift through storytelling that I have offered the world. Well, grief and gratitude are recurring themes, both in the series yeah. and in your book, Tiny Beautiful Things, and in Wild. And in one of your Dear Sugar columns in your letter, uh, you talk about um, grief, and it's called The Obliterated Place. Mm -hmm. And I just want to read a little bit about that. You write to a father, grieving his son, telling him about losing your own mother. And you write, my grief is tremendous, but my love is bigger. So is yours. You are not grieving your son's death because his death was ugly and unfair. You're grieving it because you loved him truly. The beauty in that is greater than the bitterness of his death. You know, what message do you hope that your readers and then the people who watch the series mm -hmm. starting on Friday, that they take away about grief and gratitude and beauty? Yes, I mean, I think it's, it's exactly what you just read, that, that I think the other side of that kind of profound loss, which can feel really ugly at the time, is beauty and is generosity. The ways that we use the experiences in our lives were, that were experiences we wouldn't wish to repeat or wish upon our worst enemy, those experiences actually become very often the things that make us the bravest, that make us the strongest, that make us able to be as big hearted and compassionate and generous as we are capable of being. And so ultimately that, I mean, I never write thinking like, okay, I'm gonna send you a message. But I love that so many people take that mm -hmm. message from, from tiny beautiful things, from all of my work. Because I do think it ultimately, you know, we all suffer, but also we all experience love and joy and beauty. And to embrace the full spectrum of those feelings, I think is the meaning of, of, of a, a deep life. Well, the people who watch the Hulu series, some people may not be familiar with Dear Sugar when they, when they start to watch it. So let's go back a little bit to when you started writing Dear Sugar. It was no pay job. That's I, right. I think you were start, a struggling <laughs> writer back then and it was anonymous. So, so tell yeah. us why you did it, how you got involved. Yeah, I had just finished the first draft of Wild and sent it off to my editor. It was uh, the beginning of 2010, and I received an email from my friend Steve Almond, and he said, Cheryl, I've been writing this Dear Sugar anonymous advice column on the internet. I don't want to do it anymore because nobody reads it. It doesn't pay anything. And I thought that you would be the perfect sugar to take it over. And which is sort of funny in retrospect because I immediately said yes to this job for which I would receive no pay and no recognition. But I said yes in a, in a way that I, I ultimately as sugar have offered my, this advice over and over again, that you have to trust your gut. There was something inside of me that just said, this is, sounds fun. I was energized by the idea. And what's beautiful about not being paid for your work is you can do whatever you want to <laughs> you do. You have no boss. <laughs> That's right. And so what I decided to do is not you know, write a traditional advice column. To, I, I was going to give that column my whole heart and everything I had ever learned as a writer, I was going to give it the full force of that. I was going to make literature. So my advice columns are really personal essays. They're memoir. They're, they, I do give advice, but I also tell a lot of stories. And what happened online was totally unexpected. I grew this cult following. And so then by the time Wild was being published, my publisher was putting, saying, let's put together this collection of Dear Sugar columns. So Tiny Beautiful Things came out shortly after that. And I still, it, then it became a podcast, then it was a play. I still write the column once a month on a Substack newsletter that people can subscribe to. And I, it really has become this huge part of my life. And then now here we are with the television show starting Katherine Hahn. I mean, it all started I don't know with how a no-paid job. It all started, you trusted, trusted your gut. I trusted my gut and I said yes. And this is something I say to Sugar a lot is, is, you know, when the path reveals itself, follow it. And I think we all know that those times in our lives where, where an opportunity opens up and there are all these reasons to say no to it, but the one reason to say yes is because you feel in your body that deep inner voice says, this is interesting to me. I'm curious about this. This makes me feel more alive. And you know, none of us ever know where anything is going to lead. And so go in the direction of that energy.
Well, speaking of not knowing where anything's going to go, you also wrote a letter called The Ghost Ship That didn't carry us. Sugar responds to undecided, a man in his 40s, torn between having a child and continuing on with his child-free life. Both options are equally appealing to him and he doesn't know how to choose. So right. you write as Sugar, the people we might have been lead, live a different phantom life than the people we are. And we'll only know that whatever that sister life was, it was important and beautiful and not ours. It was the ghost ship that didn't carry us. There's nothing to do but salute it from the shore. It kind of gives me goosebumps because Aww. it's so powerful. I think everyone Thank can you. relate to that. What if, what have I done this? Right. How does that ghost ship uh, fit into the, st the series? I, I hear that's one of the episodes, episode three, I think. It is one of the, the um, episodes. And I think that we, all of us are always living in that kind of reality. When I answered this, this man's letter, what I basically said is, listen, if you have, if you become a father, that's going to be a glorious life. If you don't become a father, that's going to be a glorious life too. It'll be a different life. And so, so much of what we're doing in this show, as, as Claire, uh, Catherine Hahn, grapples with these questions that people are, are asking her. She's saying, listen, you know, honest advice isn't somebody saying, do this. It's saying, let's look at the complexity. Let's, let's, let's look at the questions that sit beneath the questions. There is almost, to, to most of our problems, there isn't one answer. It's just simply the best answer is the answer that feels the one that's right to you. And then, and then you know, what comes from that is beautiful and hard and different from what it would have been if you'd chosen something else. I think this show is so much about that embracing life's complexity rather than uh, the, the sort of black and white thinking. And Catherine Hahn has this complex character where she's also self-sabotaging and has, yes. has some bad habits. How does that fit in? Well, we had a lot of fun with that because, you know, I think so often um, we, we think of people in a binary, they're good or bad, right? They've got it together or they're all messed up. And what we really wanted to do with our Claire, our sugar, was to say, you know, the truth is most of us are, are messy, right? Mm -hmm. there, there are all these ways that, that she doesn't have it together. And and then it's also true there are all these ways she has it together. I mean, she's had a marriage that's lasted the better part of two decades. She's been the breadwinner for her family. She's a pretty good mom to her daughter, you know, as good as, as certainly good enough, right? And so you don't have to be, you know, like a total failure to be messy. And nor do you, when you're successful, should you be expected to have it all together? You know, Daily Beast uh, wrote a review, and uh, you're getting really great reviews. We are. <laughs> it's just very exciting to see. Although Tiny Beautiful Things does not follow the structure of the book at all, which you talked about, it is an honest adaptation of its spirit, making this a meaningful treat for fans of the book and newcomers alike. That's got to be really gratifying. It is, and that's what we set out to do with the very first conversations between Liz Tiglar and I, is we wanted to honor the spirit of the book. And I think that she, as the beautiful showrunner and creator of the show, has done just that. We're going to take a break right now. When we come back, we'll have more with Cheryl Strayed, and we'll talk a little bit about her personal life in Oregon. We're back in two minutes. What does it mean to heal, to move on, to let go? That is a clip from the trailer for the new Hulu series, Tiny Beautiful Things. I'm Laurel Porter. Welcome once again to Straight Talk, or as we like to call this week's episode, Strayed Talk, because we're pleased to have as our guest Portland, Oregon's own beloved author, Cheryl Strayed. Strayed has a new project based on her book, Tiny Beautiful Things, that was also adapted into a play, and now a new series streaming on Hulu. Cheryl, welcome once again. It's just so great to have you here. Thank you so much. So you, you've lived in Oregon and Northeast Portland for a long time. Yes. But you grew up in Minnesota, and then, of course, you walked the Pacific Crest Trail for 1,100 miles, yeah. and you ended at the Bridge of the Gods. And you've said when you saw Mount Hood, you had this sense that you were home. Is, is that when you knew you were going to stay in Oregon? How did you end up here? Yeah, I, essentially, I do think I walked here to my life here in Oregon. I walked the entire state on the Pacific Crest Trail in the summer of 95. And I finished my hike on September 15th of that year, two days before my 27th birthday. I was out of money. I had 20 cents left to my name. Wow. And so I landed in Portland. A friend of mine had a, a extra room in her house. She said I could stay in for a bit in Southeast Portland. So I did. And I started my life again. And I didn't know that I would 
be here all these years later. I, I had a sense of, we'll see what happens next. But I fell in love with, with Portland and Oregon. And I also fell in love with my husband, Brian Lindstrom, who I met only nine days after my hike. So I was completely out of money, as I told you, 20 cents, literally. And so I had a yard sale. I'd, I'd kept some things in Portland over the summer while I was hiking, and I put them out on a friend's lawn and sold things to raise some cash. And a man came to the yard sale, it wasn't my husband, but a friend of ours, Tom, who said, do you want to have dinner tonight with some friends? And I joined him. I met my husband there. That, that's fate, yeah. the end of your journey. The end of my journey. It's like a fairy tale, right? You it know, is. The hero always gets married at the end, you know, <laughs> the, marries the prince. I married the prince at the end of my hike. But you know, what's really important is I had to find myself first. I had to find my own way. And, and what flowed from that experience on the PCT is the life I've built here in Portland. I, my husband and I, Brian Lindstrom is my husband. He's a wonderful documentary filmmaker. We have two kids, Bobby, our daughter, who's 17. And, and she's Carver, named for your mother. Named for my mother and our son Carver, who's 18. Yeah. So you have these two, I want to go back to ending the, the journey there at the Bridge of the Gods and talking about your husband and your son, because in the, in the movie, uh, Reese Witherspoon's ends the Br Bridge of Gods like you did, and there's a car that drives over the bridge, and there are two people in the car who were your husband and son playing those parts in the movie, and you said, and they wave at Reese Witherspoon, who portrays you, and you said when you watched that scene, it was really emotional for you. What did you take away from that scene? And really, when I watched the scene being shot, that's when I cried because we're standing there by the bridge of the gods and I realize she's waving to her future life, the life she doesn't even know she's going to have. So yeah, so my son and husband are there, but then of course my daughter Bobby played the young me in Wild. So she was, when Reese would remember her childhood, that was my daughter Bobby. She played opposite Laura Dern, who played my mom, Bobby. My mom's, my mom's name was Bobby, my daughter's name is Bobby. And so to watch her reenact some of those scenes from my life with the grandmother she would never meet was an extraordinary experience. So the, the making of Wild was very much a, an Oregon experience and a family experience as well. I think we're all gonna rewatch Wild in a whole different way now with all these new insights. What is it like for you being a mom? I mean, pretty soon you have two teenagers, 17 and 18, you're gonna be an empty nester. They are, they're a junior and senior. And you know, we've always lived on the east side. They've gone to Portland Public Schools, all their, their education, and it was really, um, something for me just recently to, to get um, some last, you know, my, my son's really on the home stretch. And I'm like, okay, wait, this is going to end someday. This whole situation where I have kids in school who live at home, my son's deciding where to go to college now. And it feels like, kind of like I felt in my 20s when I went to walk the PCT. I had this sense of, I don't know what's ahead, but I'm going to walk and try to find it. I feel this now about this new era of my life where the kids will be leaving the nest soon. What's next for me? I don't know. I do know I'll keep writing. Well, I want to find out more about that. What's your next project? Are you working on another memoir? Well, yes, I'm working on another book. This one's a, a, another memoir. And I really, you know, it's a long haul. I don't know when it's going to be done, but I'm going to keep working. And you know what else, Laurel? I would love I would love a season two of Tiny Well, that's what things. I want to know is I think <laughs> after we all watch it, we're going to want a season two. But any idea about that? I don't know. You know, it's a limited series. But hey, if you love it, you know, let Hulu know. Maybe by just watch, watching it and, and, you know, I think sharing it with friends. But we would certainly love to keep telling the story. We had so much fun adapting this book into a TV show. Liz Tiglar and all the team of writers and I. And we would love to keep doing it. We have maybe about 45 seconds left, but I'd love, you know, final thought that you'd like to share with our viewers tonight. Well, what I really want to just say to your viewers is how loved I feel by Oregonians. I just have always felt so supported as a writer, and I'm so grateful for this community that values literature, that supports our, our bookstores, and, and shows people like you who have me on your show to talk about books and the, the things that we do when we, when we write. So thank you so much for that. Well, I think I can speak for everybody watching. We're grateful to have you as one of our own in Portland, Oregon. Thank you so much, Cheryl Strait. <laughs> thank you, Laurel. And we want to remind everybody at home that the eight episodes of Tiny Beautiful Things streaming right now on Hulu and let them know if you want a second season because we'd love to see that. <laughs> and we want to thank you for watching and listening to our podcast. You can find our podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Search for KGW Strait talk. We'll see you next week. Won't be strayed talk next week, but ah. for straight talk. We've loved having a strayed talk this week though. Have a great week, everyone.